Grief is something that we all deal with at one time or another in life. And there are many ways to deal with that said grief, but others end up kind of going down a route of numbness. A lot of people drown their sorrows in drinking, maybe drugs. Some people let that grief eat them from the inside out, changing who they are as a person, becoming neglectful, maybe spiteful. And others will go to even more extremes to rid themselves of this pain. Song of the Sea is the last in the trilogy of the Irish folklore movies made by Cartoon Saloon. And I honestly would consider it to be the best out of the three that I have reviewed. This movie focuses on a lot of heavy topics, but I feel like the main idea of this movie is dealing with grief and how destructive grief can be. Not only the one grieving, but on the others around you as well. It can suck the soul out of you, trying to hide those feelings, pushing them down until you are nothing but stone. Every frame in this movie is something that is worth putting up on a wall and cherishing. Nothing but pure ethereal beauty that sticks with you. The art style in this movie is the same art style of the other two, Wolf Walkers and The Secret of Kells. And I personally feel like this style excels in this medium. And that medium being the ocean. The ocean is kind of terrifying. But at the same time, they hold a lot of great things, like seals, beautiful reefs, and oil. Now, the ocean may be a terrifying place, but you want to know something else that's terrifying? Getting your identity stolen. And with the internet today, it does feel completely impossible to avoid something like that happening. And I know by firsthand experience, I don't really know why or how, but all of a sudden I started getting loads and loads of spam calls. We're talking five to six spam calls, you know, maybe even more every single day. And that's why I have started using Aura, which is today's sponsor. Aura actually shows me which data brokers are selling my information and automatically submits opt out requests for me. Cleaning up my information not only helps reduce the amount of spam I get, but it also protects me from hackers who could use this information to help them access things such as my social media accounts, my bank accounts, other sensitive information. AT&T actually revealed that 72 million customer records, both existing and former customers, were released to the dark web. And they recommended to those affected to just use strong passwords, monitor account activity, and consider credit freezes or fraud alerts from credit bureaus. But the thing is, that's a lot of work, which is why Aura does all of this for you. And the thing is, I don't have to download a bunch of different apps just because a company couldn't keep my data secure. So I think it's time that you guys take this security very seriously. And I want you to go to this link right here, or you could obviously click the link in the description and get your two week free trial today. You won't regret it. So, like I said in the beginning of this video, grief kind of sucks. So every character in this movie struggles in one way or the other when it comes to dealing pain, specifically grief. As the movie begins, we are met with our main character, Ben, getting sung a song by his mother. Everything seems perfect in a small family until some mysterious reason, Ben's mother disappears into the ocean, leaving behind Sorsha, his new baby sister. This movie really does an incredible job at keeping your eyes glued to the screen, not only in that visual aspect, but the story itself has quite a lot of mystery to it, and it really keeps you on your toes, kind of wondering what's around that next corner. And when you get around that next corner, it leaves you with even more intrigue. Well, you see Ben, he doesn't really like Sorsha. Honestly, it's pretty obvious. He has quite a disdain for her. And the reason why kind of makes sense. And it is seen time and time again throughout life. I'm sure a lot of you have dealt with similar situations. You see, Ben's father, ever since his mother left them, has become kind of a distant, neglectful father, not caring for Ben and focusing all of his attention on Sorsha. Grief is destroying the entire family, more specifically Connor. He drowns his sorrow of his lost wife by drinking and protecting Sorsha, as she is the last piece that was left by his wife. So in turn, he holds on to her with much more love than he ever will with Ben. And that leaves Ben feeling quite betrayed. And he starts to see his sister as only a nuisance to him. Connor becomes so distracted by his own grief, his own mother doesn't even deem him to be fit to take care of his own children. So she decides to take the children, hoping for a better life for them. There are actually some very interesting quirks when it comes to Sorsha. Number one, 
can't speak. And number two, with this specific coat that she found locked in a closet, she could turn into a seal. Weird, right? And of course, I can't forget the best character in the movie, Ku, who is best doggo and is Ben's companion throughout the movie. So after they were taken to their grandmother's house, Sorsha was taken by three strange men and Ben ends up following them. They start speaking complete and utter nonsense, things such as song of the sea and how that thing will supposedly save everyone. They even call Sorsha a Selkie, which if you guys don't know is the equivalent of a mermaid, but instead of humans and fish, it's more of humans and seals. And they are also considered to be one of the Fae, or what a lot of us would refer to it as fairies. Which is very interesting because these three men who kidnap her and proceed to show her their new mixtape actually consider themselves fairies. And as they start saying all these random things that we don't really understand, they start getting attacked by owls. The three men do what they can to protect her, but in a disturbing turn of events, they get turned into stone, almost as if their life was sucked out of them and put into a jar by these owls. But before they were completely turned into stone, we did hear them say that Sorsha's song is the only thing that can save her and everyone else. So throughout the movie, we follow Ben as he does what he can to protect Sorsha. And Sorsha is constantly following these little balls of light, which we assume to be the souls of these fairies. I feel like Ben has actually been set up to be the sort of guide for Sorsha as everything that they have been seeing are actual stories that his mother has told him when he was young every night. Sorsha never met her mother, so obviously she's never heard of any of these stories. But the thing that gets them through all of these difficult situations actually is the stories that was told to Ben as a child. It's almost as if his mother was doing these things on purpose, expecting something like this specifically happening. So throughout their journey, Ben and Sorsha start getting close, especially after Ben starts realizing what really happened and why specifically his mother left. Whenever the mystery starts to unravel over and over and then they start finding more and more clues, he realizes how unfair it is of him to treat her the way that he did treat her and blame her for the sole reason that his mother left and also the reason why his father kind of treats him like crap. It's kind of great how their relationship, you know, starts to get a little bit closer and closer. Oh, and she's gone. Sorsha ends up following the lights again, diving into this well, and, and Ben is unwillingly pulled in by none other than best dog Oku. Ben ends up running into a fairy whose hair has become the entire cave, something that most people would find gross, but it is oddly pleasing to look at. Not trying to be weird or anything, but I kind of want that old man to wrap me up in a nice burrito. He is known as the Great Shanhi, and I know I'm probably butchering the shit out of that, but we're gonna go with it. And he seems to have a problem where he can't really remember anything. However, again, with Ben's uh, a knowledge of the stories that his mother told him when he was young, he actually helps this man recall a bit of his memory. But this character is so interesting as each strand of hair that he holds on his head carries the entire history of a person. So using that knowledge, he discovers that his sister has been captured and potentially turned into stone, which leads him to Maka, a character that has been foreshadowed throughout the movie. Maka has been labeled as a very fearful character. See, Maka in Celtic mythology is the goddess of war and death. In this movie, she is displayed as an old woman owl hybrid. I love how they displayed the eyes of Maka. There are some genuinely creepy moments that come about when Maka turns her head or her eyes kind of creepily blink. But we learn that Maka is responsible for all of the things that have been happening, all of the fairies getting turned to stone. As Ben walks up to her home, we actually see a path that leads up to Maka made of stone and we start to realize that all of these stones are actually fairy. And on the way up to the house, all of these stones start chanting to beware of the owl. Maka is seen to be almost a defenseless old woman. She explains her reasoning for turning everyone into stone. And honestly, this character in this scene is probably one of my favorites in the movie. As Maka reasons with Ben, she tells him what she is taking from everyone and that thing that she's taking from everyone is pain or in a more general sense 
just emotions. She believes she is helping everyone by taking away their suffering, their pain, their emotions. Because she believes without emotion, you won't suffer. She even almost convinces Ben to take away his pain himself as the pain of being neglected by his father, the pain of losing his mother. We even notice that she herself has actually been partially turned to stone as she even takes away some of her emotions as well. Ben ends up hearing his dog coo upstairs and sprints to a room full of jars. But we learn that all of these jars in this room are actually the emotions of Maka herself. And we also see Sorsha is in the same room partially turned to stone. Sorsha ends up opening the jars with her magic song and Maka with her emotions reintroduced into her body, she realizes what a monster she has really become. But the reason I like this scene so much is I feel like this is something a lot of people genuinely want, is to rid themselves of the pain and the emotions, to take it away. But this movie really shows you how that just isn't the answer for those people who have ever dealt with depression in their life, me included, depression is kind of the equivalent of not having emotions. You just don't feel. You don't necessarily feel a lot of pain, but you just feel almost numb, like nothing matters. You don't want to wake up in the morning. In a way, you kind of just feel like you've been turned into stone. And I don't necessarily know if that's where this movie was going, but I feel like that is an important note to add here because a lot of people don't realize that depression isn't a simple, oh, you are suffering from a lot of pain. You are, you know, feeling really bad all the time, which don't get me wrong. Yes, that is a part of it. But I feel like a lot of times it has to do with the idea of no emotions whatsoever. That's why people who are depressed, they don't want to get out of bed. They don't want to exist in a way. They don't even want to eat because they just don't feel. But pain is a part of who you are. Yeah, it is a horrible thing to get through at times. And yeah, a lot of times people just want it to go away. But becoming numb is a lot worse. It's the equivalent of, like I said before, not existing and just turning into stone. To quote the words of another one of my favorite movies recently reviewed, Meet the Robinsons, you need to keep moving forward, not only for yourself, but for those around you. In Connor's case, for example, he needs to keep moving forward as his children are constantly getting neglected by him because of his grief, because of his turning into stone, if you will. There's a lot of Irish folklore in this movie and the way it was intertwined is really cool and unique. Every human in this movie, I wouldn't say every, but most human in this movie, besides Ben, I should say, has been paralleled to an Irish folklore character. Connor, the father, for example, the man who lost everything, sits on his lonely island and every day he weeps, so much so that it destroys everything around him. His relationship with his children, his life, his mother, everything around him just becomes a disaster. And the parallel to him is the son of the sea, Mac Lear, which in this movie is a great giant and king of the other world. After something horrible happened to him, he wept a sea of tears that threatened to flood the world itself. It wasn't until he was stopped by none other than Maka. And Maka is actually the mother of Mac Lear. And hearing the reasoning behind why she started doing all of this makes so much more sense. She started to do this because she saw her son weeping and she couldn't handle it. She couldn't bear to see the pain of her son, so she decided to just take away the emotion. And I love how in the movie we see Connor lonely on a desolate island with the lighthouse. And right next to him is an island in the shape of Mac Lear. However, if you really pay attention, you could kind of tell that it's almost like the island has been split in two, really driving home that parallel. It's almost like that island could stand up and walk over and set itself right on the island that Connor is on, and it would be a perfect fit. And of course, Maka is actually paralleled to Connor's mom. Connor's mom does kind of seem like a rude old lady, but she really does care, and she can't really keep seeing her son like this. 
So in her head, she believes taking away the pain, taking away the emotions, which in turn would be considered taking away his children. Because she believes that if he's alone, maybe he could figure something out. Or she also could believe that maybe taking away his children would help him stop thinking about his wife. Similar to how Maka felt with Mac Lear. And then we have another one, which is kind of just like a little parallel. It wasn't too big of one, but the parallel of the fairy driver and the great Shanghi, which I believe to just be that concept of seeing other people's lives unfold before him. As the fairy driver literally just carries people to and from different locations, I'm sure he's heard multiple stories of people's lives. So I feel like that was a little bit of a parallel as well. And the only reason I'm saying that is the looks of the characters are very similar. Now, I know a lot of you are wondering what happens at the end of this movie. And personally, I don't really want to tell you guys. I want you to experience it for yourself. The ending is something that I personally teared up at. And uh, I know for a fact it's going to stick with me for a while. That could also be a part of me being a father. But I really believe you guys should go and pick up this movie and watch it. It's something you really need to experience for yourself. Interpret the messages of the movie how you want to see them. The movie is a piece of art, and I feel like every person will have a different experience watching it. Grief can be dealt in many different ways, but the important part of it is that you do actually deal with it. You really need to let those emotions breathe. Don't push them down. Don't try to make yourself numb. Don't end up drowning them. Feel them. Give them room and time to exist. And as always, keep moving forward. Have a good day.